Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Japanese Literature and Culture Before 1600. Well, we just got done with Zen Buddhism. Well, well we're not done with it yet because we're going to be talking about it again. But in this case, we're going to be talking about it in the context of the theatrical practice known as no. No, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes. Sorry, that's a really stupid joke. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to perpetuate that. So, okay, we're going to be talking about no. So the, the word here literally means something like skill or craft. So it's the crafty or the skillful theatrical practice. That's just what it's called. Now, so a little bit historically about the, the no theater before we get into talking about aesthetics and um, talking about um, the play that I want to discuss for today, uh, Zami's um, Atsumori. So the theatrical form was developed, I say developed, not created, because it was sort of evolved out of other things, by a guy named Kanami. Um, you see his dates there, 1333 to 1384. So we are well into the, the Muromachi period, so we're actually in the period that we're supposed to be talking about in this unit. Um, as in collaboration with his son, who was his sort of successor and sort of the, the succession of no as an art form is, is a problematic thing in and of itself, he was born in 13 or approximately 1363. Um, they were, so they were both dramaturges and they were the form's principal playwrights. So in a sense, they invented it, but they invented it, like I said, out of other things. Um, because in many ways, no is not really a novel form so much as it combines a bunch of other stuff into a kind of like multimedia spectacle. Not really much of a spectacle, especially like if you see, if you go see a no play nowadays, you'll probably be really bored unless you know everything that's going on already. It's not, it, it's not going to get your blood pumping. It's not as fun and exciting as say a kabuki. Kabuki, even if you don't know what is going on, is actually really fun to watch. Um, whereas no is like... Okay. <laughs> um, so it, it evolved out of a bunch of other stuff, um, especially something that is known as dengaku. Dengaku were these sort of like rural planting ritual celebrations. So, you know, rice planting and rice harvesting are really important times of the year um, in Japanese culture, even nowadays. Yeah, like, I mean, there is usually, so, like, the, the spring and fall festivals that you see in a lot of, like, Japanese towns and cities, um, they are at that those times of year because that would be roughly when, you know, the, 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 the rice crop would have been planted and roughly when the rice crop would have been harvested. And so that's why you have those festivals at that time. And that's pretty much true in the rest of the world. You see festivals, you know, around planting and harvesting season. That's not specific to Japan. But they would have these sort of like dance slash song performances in these rural celebrations. Um, so that's, that's one vector of sort of um, influence. Another is this thing known as um, sarugaku, which is kind of like a um, almost circus-like entertainment. It often involved like acrobatics, um, pantomime. It was it was much more whereas. Dengaku had a kind of quasi religious I mean, it was celebratory, but it also had a kind of quasi religious character to it. Not quasi, just religious character to it. Sadugaku was more straightforwardly entertainment. Um, and, and then uh, th those are the two primary ones that I want to mention, but there are also things like, you know, court music, which is called gagaku, um, various forms of like ceremonial dance that would have been performed at, you know, shrines and also at court. Like there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. And so the point being that no as a theatrical form is sort of based in like taking a bunch of other stuff and sort of picking and choosing elements and combining them in an interesting and new way. Um, and so as a result of plucking from these like disparate traditions, the, the theatrical form itself is both quasi-religious and entertaining in nature. It's a form of entertainment, but it's also meant to have this kind of like pseudo-religious quality to it. And in fact, was often performed at temples. And so as a result, um, it's fundamentally a hybrid form. And we'll look at... Um, a selection, a little bit of a, of a no performance in a bit. And you'll see how, you know, it combines, you know, like a chorus, there's guys with instruments, there are dances, which I don't necessarily know if we would recognize these as dances, but it's a dance. 
um, you know, you have, but then you also have characters speaking lines. Like it's, so it's, you know, it's literary, it's dance, it's song, it's, it, it, it's visual, it's like it's a visual, it's all sorts of things. And theater is like that. So in other words, um, all I'm really saying is it's theater. <laughs> all right. Um, one of the things that probably Noel is most known for is its use of special masks. Now, interestingly enough, not all characters in a no play wear masks. Only the like supernatural characters do. Living characters don't wear a mask. And we'll actually see an example of this in the, the bit from Atsumori that I'm going to watch together with you. And now, um, politically, though, so that, that's that's how where the it came from, sort of artistically. Poli- again, as with you know the history of Zen Buddhism, there is a political component to this as well. Um, and what's important here is the way in which both Kanami and Zami um, had had as patrons the 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 Ashikaga, specifically um, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, who is Takauji's grandson who was their their primary patron and sponsor. Um, in addition to that, I mean, I don't know if you guys are interested in this, but I think it's an interesting aside. Um, Zayami was also courted, and I think you guys know what I mean when I say courted, by, so Yoshimitsu was 17 at the time, Zayami was 12 at the time, and they had a homoerotic relationship. Um, and I point this out because you can't, uh, you can't assume that in Japanese history they have the same like hang-ups about homosexuality that sort of we the fact even that Japanese people nowadays sometimes have. Although I would kind of argue that homosexuality in Japan was was never quite as uh, well. No, in the Tokugawa period it was. It, it's just different. It's like the, the 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 history of like homosexuality and like homoromantic and homoerotic relationships in Japan is just, it's different. And particularly in this period, especially actually amongst like um, older and younger members of the warrior class, like homoerotic relationships were not uncommon. That will change in the Tokugawa period. The Tokugawa were, or at least the Tokugawa shogunates, the Tokugawa shoguns were, I don't know, they were real prudes. <laughs> there were all sorts of like moral strictures that were placed upon people in the 17th century that prior to that didn't exist. This is prior to the 17th century, still we're in the 14th century right now, so they don't really have those hang-ups. Anyway, you guys might find that interesting. I find it interesting, so I thought I'd mention it. Um, but in talking about <coughs> the the theatrical aesthetics, Again, there are a lot of things that, that I could be mentioning, but there are two in particular that you probably need to know. One is this concept known as yugen, which can be translated as sort of like mysterious profundity or sort of mis- mystery and depth. Um, this did not come from Noel. It was originally actually a waka, a poetic aesthetic, and it referred to a kind of a sense of like sublime profundity that sort of the the, the literary or artistic thing suggests but doesn't state outright. In other words, it's a kind of feeling of the sublime or a kind of like really profoundly felt emotional loss that you feel as a result of like experiencing something that, you know, in and of itself doesn't really seem to have that. Like it's, it's you often associated with natural phenomena. So like it would be like, you know, if I were, taking a walk, you know, a hike in the woods and I saw, say, like, I don't know, like a little seedling, you know, sprouting from the ground and I look at the seedling and, you know, it immediately makes me think of, say, like my own child. Like the seedling itself has nothing to do with my own kid, but sort of my experience of seeing that little plant coming up from the ground, like I have this, per- like, I have this moment in which it sort of causes me to think of something that I feel very deeply and very profoundly. And so that's what this is. This is what Yugen is supposed to be. That like there is something beyond what you're seeing before you that somehow nevertheless what you see before you is actually like, transmitting to you. It's it's very difficult to, to, to describe because again, it's something that is meant to be felt rather than explained. Um, the other really important concept for talking about Noel, at least in terms of like, you know, the total theatrical performance is this concept that gets 
in my mind, really overused in, in Japanese discourse of Japanese aesthetics. But anyway, it's worth bringing up. Jo, ha, so we have Jo, Ha, Q, which um, literally means like preface, break, fast, <laughs> or rapid. I prefer this translate. This is my own translation here. So we have preface, then the middle part is development, and then sort of like rapidly coming coming to a conclusion. Now this aesthetic concept originally comes from gagaku, uh, the the court music that I talked about earlier. Um, but in Noel, it doesn't necessarily. Well, I mean, it can refer to individual plays, but it usually refers to like the total program. So with a no performance, you usually don't go to just see one play. You would see like a series of plays. And so from in um, Zami's writing, he so the ideal sort of no program is five plays. And so the, the, the preface, the, the beginning, the introduction is one play. And then the, the ha, the sort of the break or the development is sort of the the body or most of the the program so that's plays two three and four and then the sort of the swift conclusion is a short play play five at the end so the idea is that you have sort of like an ordinary length play at the beginning that sort of like sets up what the whole program is going to be and what it's going to be about and then the the next three plays kind of develop that idea and then the last play, which is shorter than all the others, sort of brings it to this like sudden conclusion. It's like it's like an inst almost like an instant climax. It's like you're sitting there, it develops, and then tension builds, and tension builds, and tension builds, and then, builds, and then bam. And so that's the whole idea. As I noted, <laughs> I, I I couldn't resist saying this because so it's it kind of gets over -apl applied in talking especially about japanese media i see this all the time where like, i'll read a paper and it's like oh this is just like johaku this is johaku and i'm like <sighs> yes insofar as and this is something that i note right here insofar as everything has a beginning a middle and an end <laughs> like in many ways this is just like johaku is just a way of saying beginning middle end it's a particular way of talking about especially like the middle and the end but again everything has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so then in that sense, you could be like, oh, well, so you should, the beginning is like the jaw, and then like and then the, like the, the middle part, that's the ha, and then the sort of like the conclusion, the climax, it's like Q. It's like, yes, we have the concept of like a climax <laughs> in literally every other literary culture. It's like, please stop. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> moving on from my gripes. So I want to talk a little bit about, no, not a little bit, I want to talk substantially about this play, Atsumori. Now, he, uh, its author, Zayami, was a huge fan of the Tales of the Heike. In fact, he didn't just write one play based on an episode from the Tales of the Heike. He wrote a lot. Um, honestly, just like his his number one fave. <laughs> he just he couldn't get enough of the, the Tales of the Heike. Probably because, you know, there are a lot of tragic elements. You know, tragic stories make for really great plays. I mean... That's I think everyone understands that. And literally every single theatrical tradition on the earth, <laughs> like you see tra you see tragic stories over and over and over again. And the Tales of the Heike is replete with these tragic stories. So, you know, it's it's a good it's good material to work with. However, Xiaomi doesn't just like take the encounter between um Atsumori and Kumagai and it's like, okay, here I staged it for you. No, he actually reinterprets it from a perspective well after it had happened. In fact, not only well after it happened, but after the survivor of the encounter, Kumagai, has become the monk Rensho. And in fact, that's how he's referred to. Actually, no, in the in the play, he's just referred to as monk. They just call him Hoshi, but the, the character's name is Rensho. And so this is an example of what is called a Mugen, or a dream play. Um, you don't really need to remember that. I just it's interesting because in the second half, Rencho literally says to him at one point, "Oh, is this a dream?" That's all that means. <laughs> he thinks it's a dream. It's not actually. Well, I mean, you could say it's a dream because dreams in like Japanese literature are complicated. Anyway, it's a dream play. But sort of the the core of what I want to talk about is right here. And that's sort of the way in which the play deals with Buddhism. 
Now, I'm going to say this first, and then I will explain it. So the Buddhism that you see in the play as you're reading it, in other words, the Buddhism that the characters themselves profess is pure land. However, so the Buddhism in the play is pure land, but the Buddhism of the play, which is to say like the perspective of the text and sort of the totality of what you're seeing in the performance is Zen. What does that mean in practice? So it means that sort of, I mean, the events are fairly straightforward. I mean, I'll just go over it fairly quickly. I mean, hopefully you guys have read the play and if you haven't, Shame on you, but I'll still go through it. I'll summarize it. So what happens is this monk, Rensho, who was um, Kumagai no uh, Jiro Naozane, uh, he is riding along and he encounters these threshers. I believe the translation I had you guys read calls them mowers. They're threshers. <laughs> There's a term for this. It's threshing. Sometimes You have to understand that sometimes translators aren't really familiar with it, like agricultural terminology, and so just bear with me. So he runs into a bunch of threshers and he ends up speaking to, you know, a young man among them who it will later be, it will later be revealed as actually Atsumori or like the ghost of Atsumori. And he stops and he encounters them and, you know, he asks them about what, what they're doing. And it's interesting because there's this sort of like subtle play between the young man and Rensho that the young man says to him, like, I'm someone who has a... A relationship to Atsumori, he's being a little cheeky about it, and the whole point of this is to sort of is to draw Kumagai in. Sorry, Rensho. I guess we should call him Rensho because that's as a monk, that's who he is. Trying to draw Rensho in and sort of like get him more invested and more interested in what's going. On. This is important. Sort of the drawing Rensho in is not just important, like in terms of like say the the, the plot, you know, to get him involved and so that way he can, do, but also because like. It, it's it's creating this like cyclical dynamic between these two characters that will be sort of fundamental to the, the philosophical and thus religious perspective of the text. And this is what I mean by sort of like the Buddhism of the text is Zen because this this is sort of a Zen thing that is going to happen. So um, Atsumori seeks salvation. So and then in the second half. The second half begins with Atsumori's ghost revealing himself like, I am Atsumori. And then Rensho was like, whoa. And then most of the the second half of the play is Atsumori along with the chorus, like telling his personal story and sort of recounting the events of the Tales of the Heike or that moment in the Tales of the Heike from his perspective. Now, and so in this or at the very end, um, Atsumori sort of like asks for salvation from Rensho and sort of Rensho at several points even recites the the Nimbutsu, calling the name of the Amida Buddha. Um, but what is, so there is the thing, like there are the prayers that Rensho makes that are sort of pure land in nature. But when I say that what they do, meaning sort of the way in which the characters interact in terms of the play is much more Zen-like. And we actually see this from the very beginning of the text. So if you look at, no, sorry, that's, there we go. Uh, I gotta scroll all the way back up. Act one. To Shdai music, Rensho enters carrying a rosary. He stands in the Shdai spot. I'm, I didn't want to get into like the Waki Shdai stuff. I just don't think it's relevant. If you guys are interested, you can like contact me. I'll explain to you. <laughs> um, so Rensho says, the world is all a dream, and he who wakes the world is all a dream, and he who wakes, casting it from himself, may yet know the real. This is not a pure land thing to say. Because what is Rensho saying here? He's saying that the person who sort of like wakes from the dream, the dream being in many ways an analogy to a delusion, the person who wakes from the delusion or sort of like removes the delusion, sort of like um, absolves themselves of these false perceptions, he who wakes, casting it from him, may yet know the real. And so, even though he doesn't use the term Buddha nature here, what Rensho is saying is in many ways a perfect analogy for the way in which like Zen understands how like one's personal salvation is supposed to work. 
So even though this is a pure land monk who's saying this, the thing that he's saying is very Zen-like. Because what he's talking about is that he's not in this opening line saying like, oh, we need to look to the Amida Buddha to save us from our circumstances. No, what he is describing here is that's that sort of mode of self-perfection. That sort of like the conditioning of the self to understand one's true nature to, as he say, as he says, may yet know the real. So that's one of the things that I mean when I say that like, the text has a Zen perspective. And in many ways, sort of the characters will do and say Zen things almost despite themselves. And so just to sort of sum this up, the waking from a, a dream to know the real is an analogy. It's, it's not sort of a restatement of a Zen principle, but it is an analogy to how in Zen one seeks to remove those impediments. So the waking being like the removing of the impediments to understanding your one's own true nature, that is the Buddha nature. Um, also, in terms of the plot, the revelation of Atsumori's true nature itself, the way in which it sort of gets revealed through the sort of like curious interplay and doubling is itself a very Zen-like thing. And also the play doesn't come out and say but it kind of implies that the nimbutsu the sort of like the central pillar of pure land buddhism is insufficient so if we look at um in the the reading i assigned you guys on page 471 so th th this interchange here is really 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 important so at this point atsumori reveals himself behold rensho i am atsumori and Rencho responds, strange, as I chant aloud, the, chant aloud the name, so this is literally what he's saying, like I'm, as I'm saying the Nembutsu, beating out the rhythm on this gong, and wakeful as ever in broad day, I see Atsumori come before me. The sight can only be a dream. Why need you take it for a dream? For I've come so far to be with you in order to clear karma that is real. So, karmic bond, I'll come back to this in a bit. <clears throat> And that's right, here's the kicker. I do not understand you, for the name has power to clear away all trace of sin. Call once upon the name of Amida, and your countless sins will be no more. So the sutra promises. As for me, I have always called the name for you. How could sinful karma afflict you still? So, the text doesn't come out and say, hey guys, Nenbutsu, it's insufficient or it doesn't work. It implies it, though, because as he says, I have always called the name for you. How could sinful karma afflict you still. Atsumori says, deep as the sea it runs, O oh, lift me up. And then this is interesting here because Rensho actually completes his statement. That I may too, that I too may come to Buddhahood. Let each assure the other's life to come, for we, one's enemies, are now become, in very truth, fast friends in the law. The law here is the Dharma. Now, so I've, I'll touch a little bit on, on sort of what Rencho says, but look at the way in which this works out. So they are, in a certain sense, like their mutual salvations. So the karmic bond between them has created this circumstance in which they can only really absolve one another. And that's not something that is achieved as a result of like this practice of like just saying the name of the Amida Buddha over and over again because the text implies that that hasn't saved Atsumori, <laughs> what actually works is sort of like them coming together and resolving their comic, karmic bond together. Now, what is Zen about this? Well, think back to what I said in you know my previous video about Dogen, is that there is a oneness, a unity, in all of these things that we see as disparate as we see as distinct. And in fact, in the case of Atsumori and Rensho, their fates seem to be disparate. But what the play is asserting is that in fact, because as a result of their comic, karmic, comic, karmic bond, their fate is actually the same fate seen from different perspectives. In other words, it, un, so then like, you know, here we have sort of like, here is their karmic bond and sort of like the way in which it needs, and sort of the thing that needs to be resolved. So, and then in many ways, it's like, so imagine I'm Atsumori, and then you guys in the camera are um, Rensho. So we're looking at the same thing, but, but what I see on my side 
appears to be different from what you all see as, a, as the camera from this side. But again, it's the same thing. And that goes back to that, that point that Dolgen is trying to make. There are these things that we perceive as different, but they actually have a fundamental unity. And so what the play is trying to do for these two characters, although more for Rencho, Atsumori in many ways already knows this, <laughs> more for Rencho is to, to get them to understand and come to grips with the fact that their fate, so to speak, is actually the same. That the only way the two of them can have salvation is by recognizing the fundamental unity of the thing they each see as different by removing this false perception. And so the play actually does this really brilliantly by having this kind of call and response effect. The sort of the finishing of, of you know, each other's sentences and the, the way in which, so Atsumori begins it deep as the sea it runs, oh, lift me up, and then Rensho says that I too may come to Buddhahood, and then Atsumori, let each assure the other's life to come, Rensho, for we, once enemies, Atsumori, are now become Rensho, in very truth, Atsumori, fast friends in the law. So you have two speakers but in a sense, they're saying the same thing. They are each parts, they're each moments, if you will, in the saying of the same thing. And that that whole statement then shifts, again, the idea of like sort of the moment shifting between them. So what we see in the play is actually like a theatrical realization of a fundamental philosophical principle in Zen Buddhism. And so that's what I mean when I say that, like, so Rensho is a Pure Land monk, and he says Pure Land things, and he says, I've said the name of the Buddha for you so many times that you should be fine. So in the text, the Buddhism is Pure Land, but the, the Buddhism of the text in the way in which, like, not just of the text, but of sort of like the whole theatrical performance, like, causes them to do things and for us as the audience to see what transpires between these two characters in Zen terms. So that's how that works. I realize it's a little complicated, but I hope you guys are starting to sort of like pick up on that. And you can even kind of see it in what they say as well. So, oh yeah, okay. So when Atsumori says here, let each assure the other's life to come. This is an interesting point because if this were, you know, l let's think of, you know, dogmatically about, you know, Pure Land Doctrine. In Pure Land Doctrine, it's not the individual that assures their life to come. It's not sort of like you and me assuring it for each other. It's, it's the Buddha. <laughs> it's the Buddha. It's this thing that exists outside of us and that we can only hope to beseech them. But what Atsumori is implying here, but again, using, using the terminology of pure land, like this idea of like praying for one's salvation, but they are sort of each other's salvation rather than looking to this like third party. <clears throat> so there is a slight difference here. Now, um, in turning to the sort of the, the, the last bit of the play, um, the last, I guess you could say third or so, is Atsumori together with the chorus recounting his own story. Now, the irony here is, is that sort of like, despite the fact that these two were sort of thrown against each other in opposition, so in other words, they're supposed to be antagonists, they're supposed to be sort of like at loggerheads and distinct and separate, like I'm on, you know, um, <laughs> Kumagai slash Rensho is on one side, Atsumori is on the other side, Strangely, by being set against each other in this antagonistic way, it actually forges this lasting karmic bond that can only be resolved by Atsumori forgiving Rensho and Rensho praying for Atsumori's salvation. They become fundamentally linked. The karmic bond makes them one moment, one unified existential moment, as that translation of Dogen's term would put it. So before I kind of wrap up my thoughts on the play Atsumori, I want to look at this bit from the end. Hopefully this won't be too loud. So here, um, at this point, so in the end, 
struck, you know, completely struck, my body completely struck down, is what the Japanese says. Um, this is the moment in which Atsumori has realized that, you know, he is he's at his end, and... Okay, now this is really important. I'm going to pause right here. So you may not have seen that, but what he did is he, he drew the sword. Now, this is the moment in the play. Let's look at the very end. In which Atsumori, sorry, the chorus more specifically, is describing the, the fateful encounter. So at this moment, Atsumori wheeled his mount and swiftly, all undaunted, drew his sword. We first exchanged a few rapid blows, then, still on horseback, closed to grapple, fell, and wrestled on upon the wave-washed strand. But you had bested me, and I was slain. Now karma brings us face to face again. You are my foe, Atsumori shouts, lifting his sword to strike. And, so, and as the stage notes, at this point, <coughs> Atsumori, the, Atsumori's ghost, the, sort of the character in the play, has drawn his sword in reenactment of this fated moment in which Kumagai struck him down. So what's ha happening on stage is an imitation of that earlier moment when he and Kumagai fought each other. So he takes his sword out. And then the moment when he goes to strike, so this is, this is Atsumori like miming, dying. And this is the, this is the dance, so to speak. Like again, we wouldn't necessarily recognize this as, as a dance. So this is where, um, you get this um, <laughs> really fraught phrase, you know, that we will sort of, sort of in the end, um, together we can live on the same lotus throne. Hoshi, so this, he's, Hoshi, this is O oh Monk. Oh, dude, just to point that out, that's, um, where is this? <sighs> they shall at last, they at last shall be reborn together upon one lotus throne in paradise. And then the translator here has Urensho in the play. It just says monk, it says Hoshi. So the, the Hoshi here is um, Ibaka. He's addressing Urensho. And by the way, Urensho is sort of sitting in the corner in, so as you're looking at the screen, what would be the bottom right? And that little bit right there where the, the ghost of Atsumori approaches Rensho sitting in the corner of the stage with his sword drawn at the moment when the chorus is singing, you know, we will come together and eventually they will be reborn together on the single lotus throne in paradise. He drops the sword. The resolution, so even though he's miming this moment in their lives when the two of them fought, the resolution in sort of the retelling is actually to give it up. And so this is once again an example of what I mean by sort of the, the Buddhism of the play is Zen. Because the way in which they sort of like resolve their karmic bond and sort of the complications that come as a result is literally, and so the, the actor literally physically drops the sword onto the stage and so in many ways, like giving up, like dropping those false perceptions, like dropping the things that stand in the way of us, like having a more perfect understanding of ourselves, the sort of sign of that in, in the performance is the actor literally physically dropping the sword. The sword being in many ways the thing that sort of stands between them, like this expectation, it becomes a symbol of the expectation that they are meant to fight each other when in reality what the karmic bond is meant to establish between them is that they are in fact each other's salvation. We are no longer enemies, as Atsumori's ghost says. So if we go back to the text for a second... <clears throat> Rensho, you were no enemy of mine. And it's at that moment that he drops the sword and he begs, or rather the chorus, like sort of in his voice, because it's not the, the, the Atsumori character himself um, singing, singing. At this point, it's actually the chorus sort of like singing on his behalf. And so what will happen is, yeah, he drops the sword. And then the ghost of Atsumori goes back to the opposite corner. And then, so this is where he sort of begs him 
to to pray for on his behalf. He backs into the corner, and then you'll see him bring his hands together, and this is like extremely um, <laughs> this, this 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 gesture that that he's making here of like putting his hands together like this. The fact they don't even completely come together, it's meant to sort of signal that like he's he's beg he's beseeching Atsumori like um, it's a gesture of prayer. His hands come together, sort of. And then it is at that moment that the ghost of Atsumori very, 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 very slowly exits the stage. <laughs> the, the, the stomps here are important, too. I'll get to that in a sec. So, yeah, so he he, he stamps out sort of the, the, the final beat of the play, although, um, and then there's, once the the song ends, there's silence as both. So Atsumori exit f exits first, and then uh, Rensho follows after him and exits the, in the same direction. Um. So what what what's interesting about this? What 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 can we conclude from all this? So I think I've made my point that like a lot of what is going on in the play, sort of like the mechanics, like and the the aesthetics of the play, are pointing in a more Zen direction. But the, the, the thing that I want to end on is that unlike Honen, who way back when was like, you know, esoteric Buddhism is crap. <laughs> the only thing you need is the Nen boots. It's like the play also in many ways sort of represents how Zen doesn't really supplant these other things. In other words, the play doesn't really try to replace Pure Land Buddhism because in many ways Pure Land is sort of like the mechanics is, is sort of the actual thing that, I mean, Atsumori, I mean, the very last thing that Atsumori says is that he wants Rensho to pray for him, but that, that prayer only will now work that um, Atsumori has forgiven him for what he has done, namely killing him. <clears throat> so, like, Pure Land is still central to, like, what the characters in the play need to do, but that sort of perspective on Pure Land Buddhism now has a kind of like Zen overlay. In other words, there is an additive principle here. You can look at it both from the perspective of the way in which Pure Land Buddhism is used in the text, but also in the way in which the text itself presents these philosophical ideas underlying Zen Buddhism and like how that is meant to for like to explain certain phenomena and certain relationships. Like, you know, there was that moment when Rensho says, you know, I've been, you know, saying the name of the Buddha, you know, I've been saying the name of the Amida Buddha over and over again for you for some time. How is that you can still have the, how can karma still afflict you in this way? Like, in other words, the point that the text is making is not that Pure Land is somehow like bad. It's more like there are things that Pure Land doesn't explain. And that's so like then the Zen overlay kind of adds back in the bits that Pure Land can't explain. And so ultimately the play reflects that fundamental, that shows how Zen and other Buddhist dreams are not incompatible with each other. It's more like in many ways what Zen is saying, like, you know, Zen is the one perspective, Pure Land is the other perspective and is trying to demonstrate in theatrical terms, in artistic terms, that fundamental unity. And sort of the unity there is really important. So that's what I have to say about um, the No Theater. Um, there's a lot that I didn't get to, but in sort of, in an effort to kind of like have a clear point to make, I, I wanted to focus on sort of the, like the way in which um, no aesthetics sort of use the, those Buddhist principles that we've been learning about. So um, that's all for today. Um, I want to end this video by saying that I hope all of you are taking care of yourself in these uh, trying times. Um, stay healthy, stay safe, uh, take care of yourselves, and I hope to see you all on the flip side.